All right, in our last video, we took a look at reptilian lungs and reptilian breathing mechanisms. And in this video, it's time to take a deep dive into mammalian breathing systems. So mammalian lungs are characterized by their extreme branching. There are 23 levels of branching to our own lungs. So when air enters our lungs, the initial passageway that that air travels through is the trachea. The trachea splits into the primary bronchi. Those primary bronchi split into secondary bronchi. And then I kind of shortcut here through some higher order bronchi, right? We don't need to know all 23 levels of branching. I just want you to know that there is a ton of branching involved. And eventually we're going to get down to the level of the bronchioles. So that's pictured uh, down here on the lower left, a picture from your textbook. And the bronchioles then feed into structures known as the alveolar ducts, so conducting into the alveolus, and the alveolar sacs, illustrated here. And you might not be able to see the uh, photo of the alveoli that's behind my head in this lecture video, but hopefully you can see that on the lecture slides. So one thing you need to know about mammalian lungs is that this entire structure is not the site of gas exchange. Gas exchange only takes place at the level of the alveoli. So all of those uh, conducting airways from the tracheal to the bronchi and so forth and so on um, are often referred to as anatomical dead space because no gas exchange happens there. They're just tubes that the air is going to travel through. And in contrast, the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs, those are sites where gas exchange will take place. So those structures are referred to as the respiratory airways. So let's take a look at how these spaces get used as mammals breathe. Uh, there's actually really dynamic use of different breathing spaces. Um, depending on the circumstance that an animal is in. And I know I've drawn this up on this slide here, but it's also kind of useful to walk through this um, individually. So I'm also gonna draw this out on a piece of paper. And what we'll start with is during what we might call quote unquote normal breathing, right? Um, we're basically going to use just a fraction of the total volume of the lungs, right? So uh, typical lungs, uh, in a person might have a total volume of about six liters, right? And uh, when just breathing in and out relaxed, um, we're only using about 500 milliliters of that full lung capacity. So, uh, and when we're breathing in, in and out, I uh, refer to that volume uh, that we breathe in and out as our resting tidal volume, okay? Okay, so out of that six liters, we're only using 500 milliliters of it. Uh, it's a pretty small fraction, okay? In this picture, above that, I've got another volume referred to as the inspiratory reserve volume. All right, so inspiratory is simply an alternative word for, you know, breathing in. So this inspiratory reserve volume, another 3.1 liters or 3,100 milliliters uh, is what we can tap into if we take an extremely deep breath, right? So if you're just breathing normally and then you breathe in deeply as uh, much as you possibly can, uh, then you're starting to uh, use your inspiratory reserve volume, okay? Then on the other side of this graph, I've also got illustrated what's called the expiratory reserve volume. Right, so this is another 1200 uh, milliliters, okay? And this expiratory reserve volume reflects the maximum amount of air that you can possibly exhale out of your lungs, okay? So um, when I had to do the breathing exercise to think about the use of elastic rebound in reptiles, right, I was actually having you use your inspiratory reserve volume and then relying on elastic rebound to come back to our resting tidal volume range. And then when I had you um, uh, engage in uh, taking a you know a breath out, um, I was having you tap into your expiratory reserve volume and then return to your resting tidal volume. Okay, 
And this is a point of complete exhalation, right? So uh, if we exhale as much as we possibly can, this is as much air as we can actually get out of our lungs. So there's still, even after that, a residual volume of around 1200 milliliters, okay? So that volume we cannot exhale out of our lungs. All right, so it's always there. And uh, when talking about these different breathing volumes, people often have questions about, well, what does it mean when you get winded? Does that mean that you're actually releasing that residual volume and uh, then you need to you know, restore the residual volume and then start breathing again? Actually, when you get winded, that's actually a nerve response um, where your diaphragm is temporary, temporarily paralyzed. Um, so you still have that residual volume present. Um, you just can't use any volume until your diaphragm recovers from that temporary paralysis. Okay, so now a little bit of a puzzle here about how alveoli retain their shape. All right, so if we're looking at an alveolus uh, full of little alveoli, so an interesting element, all of the alveoli uh, in an alveolus are going to be similar in their overall size. Um, and I want to remind you that when we're thinking about gas exchange membranes, you know, typically a gas exchange membrane has to be permeable to water in addition uh, to allowing the movement of gases. Um, if it's not permeable to water, then gases also are not able to freely diffuse through. So uh, along with um, having you know, this type of shape, uh, there's also a very thin layer of liquid lining the inside of one of these alveoli. And uh, the reason why it's sort of a puzzle how these alveoli retain their shape, um, if we think about uh, what we understand from you know, studies of physics um, and the physics of what happens to very small bubbles, um, if we have a liquid solution and we have a very small bubble that forms, right? so there's a very thin layer of uh, water surrounding the outside of this bubble, um, in general, uh, the uh, forces acting on this bubble are going to favor collapse of the bubble because of the of water's property of cohesion. Okay, so now here in an alveolus, we've got a very thin layer of water, very much like uh, one of these bubbles. So the force of cohesion is going to favor collapse of the alveolus. So how is it that alveoli have managed to overcome uh, the uh, impacts of uh, cohesion, of that property of water, uh, to uh, avoid collapsing? Okay, and uh, the alveoli are saved by uh, a substance that's dissolved um, in this aqueous layer called the pulmonary surfactant. Um, so if we examine the composition of this very thin liquid layer, it's a liquid with stuff dissolved in it, and a major component of that is pulmonary surfactant. And pulmonary surfactant is a particularly cool uh, substance. It's a mixture of both lipids and proteins, and pulmonary surfactant is involved in maintaining a dynamic surface tension uh, inside of the alveoli, right? So here we've got just a single form of uh, surface tension cohesion. Um, pulmonary surfactant is a little bit different from that. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, as a given alveolus gets larger, right, so if my alveolus gets larger, Okay, and it has pulmonary surfactant present. Okay, the pulmonary surfactant is going to cause an increase in surface tension. Okay, so that is going to favor pulling the sides of this alveolus back together. Okay, now in contrast, uh, if we have an alveolus that is smaller, okay, at a smaller scale, 
the surface tension present on um, is impacted by the pulmonary surfactant and the pulmonary surfactant decreases surface tension okay and so because it decreases surface tension that allows the alveolus to expand back outward okay i'm just going to interrupt dr clark for a second here to point out that uh, soap also acts as a surfactant right so that's part of why when you have soapy water you can have bubbles that form and that persist and so as a result, when we go and look at all of the alveoli inside of um, one of these alveolar sacs, uh, we'll notice that they are all very similar in size. And that's useful, uh, as we're going to see. And pulmonary surfactant has a very long evolutionary history. Um, so, uh, you know, diverse mammals have it and, uh, you know, properties uh, can vary across uh, mammalian groups. All right. So... Now, for thinking about the gas that's present um, in these alveoli, the composition of the gas inside of an alveolus is not the same as the composition of atmospheric gas. And I want you to take a second and think, and think about why that might not be, uh, and then we'll walk through that. So here's what you have to factor in. Before you breathe in, for looking at this diagram, of uh, different volumes of air that are found uh, in the mammalian lung, right? Before you breathe in, you're going to be here in terms of overall volume. So before you breathe in, you've got your full expiratory reserve volume present, 1200 mils, and you've got your residual volume present, another 1200 mils. So you've got 2400 mils of air in your lungs before you breathe in. And 170 mils of that air is present in the conducting airways, right? So part of that anatomical dead space. Okay, that's before you breathe in. So now if you breathe in, you're gonna add 500 mils of air, and that 500 mils of air out of that 500 mils of air, 170 mils are just going to go into the conducting airways. So if we breathe in, sounds great. We're going to get 500 mils minus 170 mils to the conducting airways. So what's that going to give us? That's going to mean we're only going to get 330 mils uh, into gas exchange portions of the lungs. Okay, so our net is only 330 mils of air into those portions. So only, only 330 to the respiratory airways, okay? Along with this, uh, if we think back to what I showed you with the unicameral uh, reptilian lungs, right? That pre-existing air already in the lungs is going to move deeper into the lungs. Just that's the way the physics works, okay? So as an end result, uh, what's going to happen after you've breathed in, it isn't as though you get 500 mils of fresh air mixed in. You're going to have 2,400 mils of stale air, or 88% of the air in your lungs uh, will be, still be there, plus another 330 mils of fresh air, 12%. So already, you know, if you're just thinking about the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere, um, you know, I haven't told you anything about the percent that might be present in that stale air, but you can imagine it's pretty low. Um, we're only replacing about 330 mils with uh, fresh air, so not a lot of extra oxygen. Uh, this has an interesting consequence on what happens at the level of the alveoli, right? So again, in the alveoli, um, you know, I... Uh, we aren't seeing a change in the overall volume of this structure as we breathe in and breathe out, right? So uh, we are only going to see simple diffusion uh, impacting the movement of gases at this scale. Um, and so because we're mostly mixing uh, stale air with our fresh air, we don't actually see a huge change in the gas partial pressure um, that we would find in inside of one of the alveolar sacs. So we can say, this is relatively constant. Okay. All right. So I wanna go back to an earlier point. 
Earlier, I talked about an animal's uptake rate. So, you know, what can an animal do uh, if it wants to get in more oxygen, right? The uptake rate is equal to the ventilation rate of the medium times the concentration gradient of the gas um, between compartments of that medium, right? Uh, and so in this case for oxygen, you know, milliliters of oxygen per minute. So I just told you that um, the partial pressure of oxygen here in the alveolar sac uh, remains relatively constant because we're mostly mixing uh, stale air back in with fresh air and we're only seeing movement of gases in and out via simple diffusion. So if this is pretty constant, right, and uh, whatever we have here, we're going to treat that as being relatively constant for now as well. Um, what is going to be the main way that an, a mammal can increase its oxygen uptake? And drum roll, by changing ventilation rates, right? We can't do much to change this. The main way that we can increase our oxygen uptake is simply breathe more frequently. So Let's talk a little bit about ventilation cycles in mammals. So uh, in mammals such as ourselves, um, the inhalation is an active process, right? So I talked a little bit about how in reptiles, um, they rely on uh, elastic rebound uh, for a component of um, uh, the breathing cycle. Uh, only one phase is active. In mammals, uh, the inhalation phase is active. So uh, when we inhale, um, uh, a, set of two different muscle groups um, are contracting to expand the volume of the rib cage. So that's uh, both the diaphragm and then also a group of muscles called the external intercostal muscles. And just to show you what those look like, um, you know, here's a person, uh, here are muscles in between the ribs. And so when these contract, they help to bring the ribs open and down. So they help to expand the volume of the uh, rib cage, okay? When we finish uh, in inhalation, um, what will first happen is a relaxation of those muscle groups. And so that's going to facilitate the release of air uh, using some elastic rebound. When we start to exercise, so when we're exercising, our oxygen demand goes up, um, we switch from using elastic rebound to exhale to now using active exhalation. So when we exercise, not only do we increase our ventilation frequency, we also increase our ventilation volume. So uh, we go from just using you know, this uh, uh, resting tidal volume here, right? So when we start to exercise, then we're going to start to breathe in more deeply. We're going to tap into this inspiratory reserve volume. And we're also going to start actively exhaling. And so we're also going to start tapping into this expiratory reserve volume. So when we exhale, our internal intercostals will contract the rib cage, And our abdominal muscles will also help to squeeze the diaphragm upwards. And just to, again, show you, so that here are the uh, internal intercostal muscles. So you notice these are located closer to the front of the rib cage, right? So when these contract, they're going to squeeze the ribs closer together. So they're going to help uh, push air um, out of the lungs. Okay. All right. So I've got a question for you. Um, what do you think will cause mammals to change ventilation rates? Uh, and I'm going to talk about four different possibilities. So one, um, as I've just discussed, is exercise. And we're going to come back to that point in a little bit. Um, but, you know, I want you to think back now to uh, talking about this topic with fish, right? So I brought up, you know, three different possible factors that could cause fish to change ventilation rates. And I want you to think back again to which out of those three factors doesn't matter to fish. Um, but so here are the possibilities for mammals. And I've added one additional factor, and you'll see why in a little bit. All right, so exercise, uh, change in the oxygen partial pressure in the environment or in the blood, um, a change in carbon dioxide partial pressure, and potentially um, blood uh, pH or blood proton levels. And that's a, a new item um, added to our list. So let's take a look and see uh, how these things impact uh, ventilation rates. 
I'm going to talk about carbon dioxide first. Uh, and the reason um, that I've incorporated blood pH is because carbon dioxide and blood pH um, are related to each other. Um, as carbon dioxide levels increase in the blood, uh, proton levels will also increase, so pH will drop or become more acidic. Um, and so therefore, pH can also affect how much carbon dioxide is dissolved in the blood. So to understand this, uh, we need to look through a set of chemical reactions um, that I've illustrated here on the slide, and I'm just going to uh, rewrite this uh, chemical set of chemical reactions um, to the left. And this also gets back at the point um, that uh, carbon dioxide has a much higher solubility than oxygen does. Part of that is because uh, carbon dioxide reacts much more easily with water, okay? So when um, carbon dioxide uh, reacts with water, it will first form an intermediate of carbonic acid, okay? So here's our carbonic acid. And from there, uh, we can have a proton dissociate, okay? Or we could have two protons dissociate. So we're going to go from carbon dioxide and water to um, some form of uh, carbonate or bicarbonate, okay? Um, and so now we have to think about um, Le Chatelier's principle, okay? So if I add more of a reactant, that's going to shift the direction of the reaction towards the product, right? If I add more of a product, that's going to shift the direction of the reaction towards the reactants temporarily, right? So if I am exercising a whole bunch and producing a ton of carbon dioxide here, right, that's going to shift the reaction in the direction uh, towards the right, towards carbonated bicarbonate production, okay? So if I'm producing a lot of CO2, um, then uh, I'm going to wind up uh, generating more protons and I'm going to wind up making blood more acidic. Okay, and that's thinking in terms of carbon dioxide. So uh, we could also think inversely in terms of, you know, if we add or take away protons, right? So um, if uh, I remove protons from the blood, so I make the blood more basic, right? If I, so if I take these away, right, that also would cause a shift in this reaction to the right. So more carbon dioxide could dissolve in the blood. And in contrast, if my proton levels go up, um, in blood, my pH becomes more acidic, right, then that's going to push this reaction towards the left and it's going to lead to an increase in uh, carbon dioxide gas uh, in the blood, okay? And I'm going to go into this in greater depth later on, but I want you to think about this point initially at this stage, okay? So both um, carbon dioxide and blood pH um, interact with each other and could influence uh, ventilation rates. So uh, let's look at and think about when oxygen and carbon dioxide cause mammals to change ventilation rates. So uh, both carbon dioxide and protons are sensed uh, by some chemo detection or chemical receptors, so by chemo detection, uh, by a region of the medulla. So I showed you that on um, picture of the brain for thinking about breathing cycles earlier, right? And um, so here's our cerebellum. So we've got a portion of the brain on um, here, our medulla, okay? Right, so this is the location of that central pattern generator uh, to um, produce that pattern to influence breathing cycles, right? To keep breathing rhythmic, right? Well, carbon dioxide and proton levels are sensed directly uh, in this region by cells that have uh, receptors for uh, carbon dioxide or uh, for acidity, okay? So these are right next to each other. So if there is a change in blood pH or if there's a change in blood carbon dioxide partial pressure, that's detected right here. The processes that control breathing are right here that's going to lead to an immediate change uh, in uh, breathing patterns, okay? So it only takes a, an increase of 0.5 kilopascals, another unit of um, uh, gas partial pressure, 
only attained a 0.5 kilopascals of carbon dioxide to double a, a mammal's ventilation rate, okay? And along with that, so coming back to that point about exercise and ventilation, you know, as you exercise, particularly if you're relying on anaerobic metabolism rather than aerobic metabolism, a byproduct of anaerobic metabolism is lactic acid, right? An acid. So if you start producing more lactic acid, um, you're going to be releasing more protons, right? And um, so that increase in acidity will also increase your breathing rate because that change in acidity is also being detected uh, in the medulla. And uh, carbon dioxide and protons act synergistically at this site, okay? So, uh, you know, if just blood pH uh, becomes more acidic, that might lead to an increase in breathing. If only blood carbon dioxide partial pressures increased, that could lead to an increase in breathing. When you have both of those things together, it's a double whammy, you're going to see an, an even more dramatic change uh, to ventilation, okay? So that's carbon dioxide and protons, two factors that can impact ventilation rates. What about oxygen? So oxygen is actually detected somewhere else. It is detected by two regions called the carotid and aortic bodies. So if you see the words carotid and, a carotid and aortic, uh, you might recognize those as the names of a couple of major arteries. So the carotid body uh, is located along uh, the carotid artery, which is the major artery that feeds the brain and provides the brain with its uh, blood supply, okay? So if we're talking about oxygen, and a very crude cartoon here, right? So oxygen uh, partial pressures are detected by this region of the carotid artery, the carotid body. And then uh, the aortic body is located uh, adjacent to the aorta. So that's the primary blood vessel uh, that feeds out of the heart, okay? So I've got, here's a very crude heart drawing. Um, here is my aortic body, okay? So notice um, these are these regions are outside of the central nervous system. So to get this signal to the medulla, to get it to actually do something, that signal is going to have to travel to the medulla. Um, so this is not as direct a mechanism for changing uh, breathing patterns um, for mammals. So if we look at the uh, normal arterial partial pressure for oxygen, um, so our normal arterial O2 partial pressure, so PO2 is normally around 12.7 kilopascals, okay? And remember I told you earlier that for carbon dioxide, a change in point of 0.5 kilopascals will lead to a rapid dramatic increase in breathing rate, right? So uh, that's all it takes. So for oxygen, it takes a drop to 7 to 8 kilopascals before we see any change in breathing rates, okay? Right, so that's about five, uh, you know, five to six kilopascals in contrast to that half of a kilopascal change in carbon dioxide to impact breathing rates. So what this means is the primary mechanism uh, leading to increases in ventilation rates in mammals is carbon dioxide partial pressure and acidity. And this is really only a secondary mechanism. And it, oxygen sensing really only plays a role under very special circumstances, such as if someone's at high elevation um, or if they've experienced a lot of blood loss. Okay, so I mentioned for exercising, there's actually two parameters that a mammal could change to increase oxygen delivery into the lungs. They could either change how much of uh, their breathing volume they're using, right? So breathe more deeply, um, or they could change breathing frequency. And both of these are going to impact total gas delivery. So uh, we can parameterize that as an animal's respiratory minute volume measured in liters per minute as uh, the tidal volume 
and the frequency of breaths. So let's just do a little bit of math uh, to work through some example respiratory minute volumes. So we've just got our RMV is our tidal volume times frequency, right? So at rest, our tidal volume, as I showed you in that picture earlier, is going to be uh, 500 mils. Okay, and we typically take somewhere around 12 breaths per minute uh, when we are at rest. So that's going to give us um, a respiratory minute volume of 6,000 mils per minute. And I should say this is 500 mils per breath, so our uh, breath units are going to cancel out. It's going to leave us with uh, mils per minute as our respiratory minute volume, or liters per minute, so six liters per minute. Now let's look at a trained athlete. So in a trained athlete, um, that athlete may wind up using a total of about 3,000 mils, right? So looking at this entire picture, just to put that in perspective. So if you're a trained athlete, you're going to tap into some of your expiratory reserve volume. You're going to tap into some of your inspiratory reserve volume. And you might, at best, get to around a 3,000 mil uh, breathing volume. Okay. So in that case, this is... 3,000 mils per breath, and our frequency is 30 breaths per minute. So collectively, we could potentially get up to 90,000 mils per minute, okay? Or 90 liters per minute uh, per breath, okay? So we've gone from 6 liters per minute up to 90 liters per minute uh, for thinking about a trained athlete uh, breathing maximally, okay? So let's take a look now at uh, our two parameters and just kind of think, okay, well, what's changing most dramatically in this scenario? Is it volume or is it frequency? And just doing the math here, we've gone from 12 to 30, right? So that's a little bit more than a doubling uh, for frequency. Okay, and in contrast, if we look at our resting volume uh, relative to our active volume, we've gone from 500 mils to about 3,000 mils, uh, half a liter to three liters, right? So our uh, tidal volume has gone up by a factor of about six times, okay? All right, so we see a more dramatic shift in volume uh, compared to frequency. And part of that is uh, we run into some upper limits in terms of breathing frequency. Um, you know, we're still needing to move, a, air is still a type of fluid, so we're still needing to move a fluid in and out. Um, there are really just hard limits to how quickly we can do that. So the more dramatic shift uh, will be in volume. Okay, so I gotta talk a little bit about a puzzle. Um, so I mentioned earlier the oxygen, oxygen utilization coefficient. Um, and the oxygen utilization coefficient goes up as ventilation rates increase, okay? So um, at rest, under this condition, about 20% of the inhaled oxygen gets used, okay? If we're thinking about a tidal volume of, of about uh, two liters, um, so between two and three, thirty percent of the inhaled oxygen gets used uh, at this higher volume. So, how is it possible that extra oxygen is getting extracted at this larger volume? And it's a very simple explanation. Simply, the anatomical dead space is constant. So in each of these cases, we're only subtracting off 120 milliliters of that air winding up in the anatomical dead space. So a larger fraction of the air when we are active is making it to the gas exchange membranes. Okay. So that brings us through mammalian breathing. I know this is on the longer side, um, but hopefully it also gives you a couple of things to think about uh, when thinking about what's happened with people uh, coping with COVID-19, right? So one of the hallmarks of COVID-19 is um, very low blood oxygen levels. 
And uh, early in early stages of the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of people showing up in emergency rooms who didn't really realize there was something horribly wrong with them um, because they were only experiencing low oxygen levels. They were not experiencing a dramatic shift in carbon dioxide or acidity uh, in their blood, right? So uh, when those when those people are experiencing that, right, it takes a really dramatic change in oxygen partial pressure before you start to see, you know, changes in breathing patterns, right? So those individuals who are starting to get sick, um, we're not detecting or responding to those low oxygen levels until oxygen levels really started to plummet and until they are very much in crisis. Um, so. Uh, understanding a little bit more about the mechanisms that regulate mammalian breathing um, can help us appreciate, um, you know, some of what's happened with this recent pandemic, in addition to just understanding basically how the, these uh, mammalian lungs function. So in our next video, we will pick up and talk about bird lungs.